Thanks for staying up later. We're happy to have Ned Beatty with us tonight. You know his work from a number of films, uh, The Big Easy and Network and Nashville and Deliverance, of course. And I read somewhere where you said, and I, I guess it still holds true, after nearly two decades of regional theater and everything else, Deliverance was your first film, and still you feel the best one you've been in. Yes. It's been all downhill. The whole <laughs> film career. Look. No. Cresting but, early. <laughs> exactly. No, but, it, you know, it is. It's, I think it's, you know, God forgive me for being, saying it out loud. I think it's a classic. I think it's going to be around even longer. For 20 years, people have been playing it and watching it like it were. It, it's a contemporary film. It doesn't seem to get yeah. age or anything. And I do think it's classic in the sense that it's about something which, which is almost a hidden subject in our culture, which is what's being a man all about. It's not something we talk about very easily. You know, it's just something people have been bringing up recently. And that's really what that film's about. I'm assuming that the vast majority of our audience is familiar with this. But just quickly, it's based, of course, on the James Dickey novel. Yes. John Borman was the director. And Burt Reynolds, who at that time was you know, kind of a TV heartthrob guy on Johnny Carson, got a lot of acting credibility, at least at that point in his career, Certainly. for his performance. John Voight was in it, Ronnie Cox and yourself, and this right. trip down the Georgia Rapids. It was like, you know, sort of like going, it was like going down the river sticks in a way, because these guys set out for a fun trip and, and sort of have to come, they have to confront most of the things that m men confront about themselves and their identity. That's why we always felt like we were doing a movie about male identity. And uh, like I say, it still holds up. <laughs> what did you learn about yourself? Oh, boy. I, a lot of things, I guess. I learned a lot about my naivete, I must say, because, uh, you know, friends asked me, I was working in the theater in Washington, D.C., and friends, and I got this part, and friends asked me, I said, well, you, you know, do you, do you feel funny about doing this part? And you know, this guy's involved in this rape scene and everything. I said, I said, no, it's a great story. I said, you know, I'm an actor here. What are we talking about? I can do this. It's no problem for me. And I had this great hubris, right, about, I, hey, you know, I can do this. And then as we approached filming that particular scene, I wasn't getting so tense about it. And, and Bill McKinney, who played the rapist, uh, and I had worked on it, and we were, Bill's a good actor and a very good athlete, and we sort of knew what we were doing. We weren't going to hurt each other. And uh, in the, you know, the fighting aspect of it. And, the, but the crew was getting very tense. Uh, nobody wanted to film this scene. And James Dickey's son, Chris, who had become a friend of mine, uh, actually felt so badly about it. He went to his dad, and he said, Dad, you know, you should cut this scene from the film. <laughs> he said, well, you don't really have to do this scene. And his dad, God bless him, was smart enough to say, you're absolutely right, we do have to do this scene because this is the scene which has the shock value to put your mind where you start questioning some of these values. You start questioning the, the great hunter value. You start questioning the, the adventurer, uh, the killer, the whole thing, you know, and it, it does work. He's a bitter Nash. Come on, squeal, squeal. From that scene on, the whole audience is in a completely different frame of mind oh, sure. because that drives home as graphically as possible that whatever cachet any of these people brought from the world they lived in into the backwoods mm -hmm. meant nothing. That's right. You could have been the president. You could have been the king of England. <laughs> it exactly. meant nothing. You were at ground zero. Right. You think you have any different perspective on rape than oh. most men because of playing that scene? I think so because... I was asked by um, some people at the editorial page of the New York Times to write a piece when they were doing a, a piece about rape when the, the, the crime was committed here in the city a few years ago in Central Park where some younger men, a group of younger men attacked a woman and almost killed her, raped her, almost killed her. And uh, they asked me if I had anything particular I wanted to say. And I said, yes, I do. I, I'm not a writer and I'll give it my best shot. I'll, I'll try to write for you. But I did write a piece and it came out fairly well. And I think what I concluded from the piece, after I thought about what it had meant to me, was that I had discovered that men could not identify with the rape victim. That women could. I've had women talk to me in great, with great poetry about that scene, about what it meant and how they understood it. But most men have to tease about it.
that's the way they deal mm -hmm. with it. And I think what I've learned from that is that men do not want to identify with the victim, which leads, leaves them in a very strange place. The only other person to identify with in that situation is the rapist. Some of the audience's reaction, though, you thought was a, a little simplistic and stupid, right? I mean, when people would stop you years later and say, squeal like a pig as if yeah, this was something funny. Exactly. But you know what's wonderful about that, though, in a way, is that it shows you that it, the reason people react that way, I believe, is the fact that it is. It's, it, it, just as you say, it takes away any veneer. If you are identifying with those characters, that scene happens. And we all tend to forget that the guys are getting ready to do something almost worse to John Voight than had just happened to my character. His character was going to have a worse thing committed, uh, if possible. And that's when Burt Reynolds shows up and saves us. But as you say, I mean, it just, it, it, it just rips away any pretense that, you know, if you're a big guy from Atlanta or any other town and you've mm -hmm. got your bucks and you've got your house and you can go out in the woods and do what you want to do and, and you're safe and secure from all harm, not true, not so. That somewhere, if you will, I mean, I think the metaphor is that somewhere within your own psyche, all these things live. It's not so much that they're just out there in the woods, is that the possibilities that you see in that film sort of live in us as men. We're back with Ned Beatty. What makes a good character actor? Mm -hmm. There's some common set of qualities that all good ones have? Good question. <laughs> I'm not quite sure. Um, character actors, we have a nice job. Um, maybe if I think about what, what I think our job is, it'll be easier for me to identify who, who could do it the best. I, I feel like our job usually is to make the story happen. The, the leading actor has, a, has a, his own job, or her own job. And it's a, I think it's a very difficult one, and it's not one I'd be very comfortable in, I don't think. But the story has to happen to them. The, the leading character is the one we want to identify with, and we want to watch this story happen to them. Uh, the character actors are the bad guys, and uh, the good guys, and the servants, and the whatever, who make the story happen. And uh, I suspect th that a character actor has to be a, a, a performer who's willing to you know, create action rather than do reaction. You know, John Wayne, uh, a lot of people can't decide whether he was an actor or not. I, I think he definitely was. He was a, definitely a leading actor. And one time he made this statement, I don't act, I react. And to, to me, that's almost a perfect way of defining what a leading actor is supposed to do. They're not supposed to fool you or talk you into anything or, or turn your head one way when you're supposed to be looking over here. They're supposed to be you, you know, having this story happen. Mm -hmm. And they do need to be reactive, and they've got to be pretty honest about it, too, or you, or you won't think that they're playing your part. You know, they won't think this... The audience will quit thinking the story's about them. So that's the way I identify the, the two basic kinds of acting, and I think character actors have to be perhaps able and willing to uh, m make things... They have to pretend more. <laughs> Are there physical mannerisms that sometimes just feel right to you for a certain character? Yeah, I, I got a kind of wonderful sort of training. I never had any formal acting training. I never went to any classes. I never went to school or anything. But I got to work so much, especially when I was a young actor in the theater, with so many different people from so many different backgrounds that, that uh, a director I worked with in Erie, Pennsylvania years ago, Newell Tarrant, Newell Tarrant one time told me, he says, 
I, 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 was, I had stopped and rehearsed and he said, what's the matter? Keep going, keep going. Let's keep this rehearsal going. I said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Mr. Tarrant, but I just found myself doing something I'd done last week in the last play we did, and I, I just don't want to do that. And he said, son, never be afraid to steal, especially from yourself. <laughs> so for the rest, I thought that was a great direction. So for the next, you know, few years, I stole everything I could. I, I used a little, you know, little bits and pieces of everything. And the outside-in method, which is what the English used to use a lot, which had a lot to do with mannerisms, mm -hmm. speech, a lot of the outward manifestations of what a character might do. Uh, Americans, you know, used to, especially in the days when we all wanted to be actors, studio actors, uh, didn't like to do that. But it's very helpful. There are times that when you can just assume a particular position or find something with your hands, and you are that person, you know, it's like, you know, you're playing a priest and you just find a little thing with your hands and, and you're there. And, you know, if it works, why not? <laughs> Wasn't there a thing in the movie, uh, the TV movie, Friendly Fire with Carol Burnett about uh, the parents who lose their son in Vietnam? It turns out he was uh, killed by, inadvertently by American fire. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a scene walking up to the cemetery to visit his gravesite. Yes. No dialogue in this long shot, but something that you thought about. Well, it's actually, it was something a man that I used to work with uh, did. Uh, the, the man I was portraying had spent a lot of time, you know, being basically a farmer. He had done different things in his life. He was a real character, but he'd also spent some time working the land. And I used to work on farms when I was younger. And one fellow I worked with had this kind of incredible thing he did <laughs> he also whistled most of the time too he have you ever known a person who, who didn't whistle out loud but sort of went i sat next to a guy like that on a bus but i moved <laughs> you wanted to kill him. <laughs> what this man would do especially when we were working very hard he was an older man and i worked with him i was a young man very young man 12 13 years old but he was a whistler like that but he used to do a thing when we were walking along together where he would he would walk and he and, and his hand would sort of he would grab the hem of his pants almost every step. And when we got ready to do that scene, I, I, we started to walk and I just started to do that. It just, it just seemed like to me, and it made me feel the way I always thought that older man felt. Um, it was one of those little nervous things, you know? Yeah. But it was a, so specific to this person I'd known on a farm. And, uh, yeah, it was very important. It, it, uh, so it's obvious that you do a lot of preparation that just can't be as easily quantified as other actors' <laughs> preparation. A lot of internal stuff going on. Yeah. But you've worked, for example, with a guy like Duval, who is known for this very meticulous preparation. I mean, to him, there's a difference between an Oklahoma accent and a Texas accent, and he's going to make sure he's wherever he needs to be uh, in Oklahoma uh, for three months to get it right. Absolutely. And I must tell you, we're talking about a man who most of us think of us as a consummate artist. I mean, you're hard put to find actors who do not respect Robert Duvall. I, he just, he's awfully good. And his gifts, I mean, the gift of his ear, he may be the best dialectician we've ever had. And yet most people can watch him and not know, and not know what he's doing. But I remember, I, I, I was watching The Godfather for the third time, and suddenly I started to notice that he was using different dialects in that film. He talked one way when he was with the family. He talked another way when he was the lawyer. He had a third dialect when he went to talk to the guy in Hollywood that tried to, you know, the guy who finally got the horse in his bed and that. When he went to speak to him, there was another accent. And then, you know, after they captured him and he was sort of, sort of being held as hostage, the fourth dialect. And it took me three times watching to realize, and it was very subtle. It was no big deal, you know. It was not, you know, you know it wasn't the way most of us would have done it. <laughs> but he had, I mean, he was literally showing us all the sides of that guy. Because that guy, had, what, he, had, he was from German immigrant parents. Mm -hmm. he, he was orphaned and he was picked up as, as a 10-year-old, brought in by this Italian family. He had grown up with them. He'd gone off to a fancy law school. He had a whole way of being a lawyer, which was different than... Yeah, well, you, you, you obviously just hit my button. I think this man's a hell of an actor. 
How about Brando? Do you ever work with Brando in anything? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, Brando does a different thing. Brando has, he is the kind of actor that demands that you see it the way he wants to show it to you. Now, Bobby Duvall shows it to you. I mean, in this, in this research and everything he does, to me, he's a consummate storyteller, and that's what I always want to be. I want to be a good storyteller, because that's what we're there to do. Brando will make you see the story the way he wants you to see it, rather than maybe the way it is, or something like that. And his power is so great that you do see it that way. But I guess that's not my way, so I, I don't, I don't buy into it too much. I, I, I got, I got sort of angry when I went to see Last Tango in Paris. I went with a friend. We went down to Beverly Hills, and we lived way out in the Santa Monica Mountains. We were sort of being hippies at the time. We went all the way down to Beverly Hills. We see this movie. And we drive all the way back. Nobody said anything on the way back in that truck, and we go back to our relative cabins in the woods, you know, in the mountains there. And three days go by, and I'm just. I'm, I'm not hardly talking to anybody. I'm fussing all the time. And finally, after three days, I thought, I saw a movie. A, it was a story about a young woman. And, it, and I watched Marlon Brando putting a piece of gum underneath a rail for about two minutes. Where was the young woman? They didn't tell me the story <laughs> that I thought I was seeing. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a big a fan of him. I think he's incredibly powerful. He makes you believe what he does. Most of us make ourselves believe what we're doing. He makes you believe what he does. And you do. You know, or you get an offer you can't refuse. <laughs> you, you were in at least one movie with Hackman, maybe, other, maybe others, but you played that guy, uh, Otis. Otis. To, uh, to Hackman's Lex Luthor. Mr. Uh, Luthor. In, in Superman. Miss Tessmacher. I haven't seen Miss Tessmacher in a while. I miss her. No, it's I. It's Valerie Perrine, wasn't it? Valerie Perrine. I, I, wherever you are, Valerie, I want to see you soon. <laughs> no, I. Uh, yeah, that was fun. But it's, uh, now, now we're talking about the great actors. We're talking about the, the, the great ones. Hackman is the most real. He's the most real. And sometimes it's, it's almost scary when you're working with him. He. He just does it, and, he, and he's real. He's just there. He has this incredible gift of not overdoing, not underdoing, not... He's just doing it. Your new film is Hear My Song. The critics have really liked it. it it's about this guy who, I guess, is, a, for lack of a better term, a, a fugitive Irish tenor. And the world is overflowing with those, isn't it? So <laughs> t t tell me about the story. <laughs> this, this, this one particular Irish... As a matter of fact, the, the fellow that we depicted in this, in this picture is real. He, he, he's... He's a real Irish tenor. He really is is around and was around. Uh, he's in his seventies now, but he he had a wonderful. His name is Joe Locke, and he was a wonderful singer. Is a wonderful singer. Um, he's the kind of singer that sort of got to the ladies. As a matter of fact, they used to say, "When Joe sings, the women weep," and um, I think they did more than just weep to tell you the truth. He had a real effect on people, and men liked him because he was sort of a man's man. He was a really fun singer. But he failed to pay as much Eng income tax as the English government wanted. Uh, the, the, their IRS is called the Inland Revenue. And Joe ran afoul of the in in Inland Revenue, which, as you know, uh, performers are wanted to do sometimes. Mm. <laughs> and uh, it got to the point where they're going to throw him in jail. And he left the country, went back to Ireland. And he left all these fans and uh, in the north of England. Not just missing him. And uh, that's kind of where our story takes off from, uh, this real thing that happened to him. And then we, we fool around with it a little bit. And then uh, we send some fellows back to Ireland to try to find him. And they do. You can see Ned Beatty these days and hear my song. Thanks a lot for coming by. Thank you. All right, time to hit the road. We'll see you later.